Welcome to the latest session in the Learning Equity and Power, or LEAP series, presented by the Center for the Study of Social Policy. My name is Anand Sharma, and I'm a senior associate at CSSP, and I'll be your host for this session. Before we jump into conversation with our guests, uh, I wanted to share a bit about CSSP and the LEAP uh, initiative. CSSP works to achieve a racially, economically, and socially just society in which all children and families thrive. To do this, we promote policies grounded in equity, support strong communities, and advocate with and for children and families marginalized by public policies and institutional practices. We seek to transform ideas into action, and LEAP, Learning, Equity, and Power, is a new initiative to help us do just that. During the session and throughout the series, we'll be highlighting and encouraging learning about what it takes to advance equity and build power in communities. And we hope that you'll join us, contribute your expertise and experience, and think about how these lessons might help you more powerfully advance equity in your community. Given CSSP's longstanding commitment to supporting community policy and systems change, we couldn't be more excited to continue our LEAP series with today's session. A new health equity dialogue, lessons from the California Endowment's Building Healthy Communities Initiative. CSSP has had the, the pleasure and the privilege of being one of TC's learning partners over the past few years. And we are beyond excited to share some of the insights, just a few, uh, that we and other learning and evaluation partners have discovered alongside TCE and its many, many partners working uh, across California. In this session, we'll hear about the relationship between health equity, power building, and democracy. And we are very fortunate to be joined by two amazing guests. Uh, the first we'll speak with, uh, Dr. Anthony Eiten, Senior Vice President, programs and partnerships uh, with the California Endowment, uh, who will offer some reflections on the past 10 years of building healthy communities. And we're also grateful for Kathy Cha, president and CEO of the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund, who will offer some reflections from her own work to support community power uh, and some reactions to the lessons that have come from the work of TCE. And without further ado, I'd like to formally introduce our, our first guest, uh, Tony from the California Endowment. Tony, welcome to the Leap Pad. How are you? Great. How are you doing, Anand? I'm doing well and just so grateful for you uh, making the time. And just wanted to start out uh, in this conversation about this new dialogue around health equity by asking you a bit of a personal question. Um, how did you come to philanthropy? And can you share a little bit with folks about how that experience shaped how you and the California Endowment uh, are thinking about health equity? Yeah, you know, it turns out I actually tell this story not infrequently um, because I think it's the journey towards health equity is is in some ways it's a personal journey that becomes an institutional journey. I, uh, you know, I went to medical school some 30 years ago um, and my intent when I was, you know, applying to medical school was to become a neurosurgeon. I had studied neuroscience and I was just fascinated with the brain. And, um, you know, I got to Baltimore, Maryland, which is where my medical school, Johns Hopkins, was located. And I was coming from Montreal, Canada. And I was sort of dropped into an environment that I, I couldn't understand. Uh, Baltimore, East Baltimore, where the medical school is located is, and, the, and this was in the middle of the 1980s during, you know, the crack cocaine epidemic, during the HIV epidemic, there was uh, sort of this surge of military style policing with helicopters and SWAT teams and and um, the environment immediately adjacent to the hospital is it w was a slum um, you know one of the most notorious slums if you will in the United States and I was being toured around by an upperclassman and he saw this look of shock on my face you know this kid from Canada and he said, what's wrong with you? And I managed to stammer out something to the effect of, when was there a war here? Um, I, I couldn't understand the conditions that I was seeing. And as I sort of started medical school, I, I would see patients from the community. And it, it, it struck me that we were being asked to do something that was, to my mind, absurd, which was to treat what were clearly social ills with pills. And, and I couldn't I couldn't quite grasp you know what my role was in that setting and um, as a consequence I, I spent some time um, studying apartheid in South Africa I, I went and worked on Capitol Hill with Ted Kennedy and I learned about uh, policy because I in, in my mind somehow the solution was universal health care that that would solve this problem and 
And over time, my sort of understanding of the nature of the challenges that were being faced in the United States broadened beyond just a sort of a medical model approach. And I started to recognize that there was an opportunity to look at essentially the, the sort of differences, the imbalances of power um, that were kind of baked into how we make policy and, and law in the United States. And a lot of it was layered on top of this history of American apartheid, um, which essentially consigned people to environments that were completely devoid of all the resources that they needed to live healthy lives. So, so that was really my first, you know, kind of exposure to sort of the structural issues in society. And it, it took me a while to sort of put piece it all together. But I feel like that experience and, and many of my colleagues have had similar experiences in different settings. That experience has sort of led us to take a kind of a structural approach to uh, addressing health. That's really helpful, Tony. I appreciate you sharing a little bit about your your own journey and, and early experiences as a uh, as a as a doctor. And wanted to ask you for folks that aren't familiar with uh, the work of building healthy communities that TC has been engaged in over the past ten years. Could you give just a quick sketch of some of the core components and and how that builds upon that kind of different way of thinking about the root causes and the issues that underlie um, the health disparities that that you all are concerned with? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I often describe the job that I have that, you know, I was offered 12 years ago. And it, it really was at a time when um, people were trying to grapple with these, um, the, the reality that when you look at health status across a place, across a county or across a community, um, and then you drill down, into neighborhoods, you see these dramatic differences across neighborhoods, some of them contiguous neighborhoods. You can see things like life expectancy differences of, of 20, 25, 30 years across the same city. And trying to understand what drives those things um, it, it, it was really kind of the question that public health was trying to unravel. And you know the, the paradigms that we had traditionally used were medical model paradigms. They talked about, you know, people's behavior, whether they smoke, they drink, they drive without a seatbelt, they have sex without condoms. We talked about access to healthcare, which is really kind of a transactional sort of paradigm that, you know, the more services and the better drugs and the better doctors you had, you know, you would be healthier. And the third was sort of a genetic paradigm that it was some sort of weird lottery where people had bad genes, you know, Basically, you had to throw medical services at them, and 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 those with good genes live long, healthy lives. And we recognize none of that explained what we were seeing at the sort of the local level, where you see these dramatic differences across neighborhoods of up to thirty years of life expectancy difference in the same city. And so we recognize that in order to try to undo some of this, we would have to sort of tackle the fundamentals. Uh, which to our mind were imbalances in power because those power imbalances explained the differences in health outcomes across these places. And so our sense was if we could build social, political, and economic power in a critical mass of people in these communities so that they could hold systems accountable for more equitable allocation of those health protective resources. And as we discovered in our work, they could help change the narrative about who they are, who we all are, and you know, uh, create a sense of belonging. Our, our hypothesis was that we could actually, over time, create opportunity conditions that were much more conducive to better health status. So that's what we did with 14 communities. Um, my boss, Bob Ross, who you mentioned earlier, basically said, Tony, I'm just gonna give you a blank sheet of paper and you know, write up a plan for doing this. And it was the most exciting um, job offer I've ever gotten. The one caveat he said is that you can't spend a nickel on health and on healthcare. So this has to be a purely social determinant of health strategy. And so that's what we came up with. I really appreciate you laying out the thinking behind building healthy communities, Tony, and um, want to bring uh, Kathy into the conversation in, in just a moment, but appreciate you, Tony, talking about 
the importance of narrative change and thinking about power building because you know as we've spoken about before it's not that folks weren't investing in those things that philanthropy wasn't investing in it but this is a much broader view that you all have taken about the concerns of uh, a health focused uh, foundation and also just thinking about um, the departure from a lot of previous place-based or community initiatives that were so focused on um, programs and services. So thank you for, for setting out. Um, I, I, should, that I should say, Anand, just quickly, that uh, I think what we decided to do was not that radical, but it was very radical for health. And so that was what was different, that you know there had been environmental justice movements, you know, Kathy's organization and others had funded these efforts, and they understood that power and narrative were critical parts of the work. But in health, it, it had really been kind of a, a technocratic approach, which was about services and sort of optimizing sort of the medical model in low income communities or places that were experiencing disparities. And what we recognized was that this was really a democratic problem, not a technocratic problem. And so we needed to bring democratic strategies to enhancing health. And I think that that has been the, the sort of the, the big secret the, that has been unveiled which is that good democracy is good for your health. And this was an unplanned plug for a recent essay that Tony actually just completed for, for CSSP, talking about thinking differently and moving from technocratic to, to democratic solutions. So appreciate that and providing a wonderful segue to our second guest, uh, Kathy Cha, the CEO, President and CEO of the Haas Junior Fund. Kathy, how are you doing? Good, thank you so much for having me this morning, Anand. Oh, it is absolutely our pleasure. And uh, as we're talking about looking back on just some of the lessons and reflections of the work that the California Endowment has done, we were so excited that you were willing to join us because um, the, if folks don't know, the Haas Junior Fund has a strong interest and in, uh, engagement and investment in areas like immigrant rights and strengthening democracy. And I was wondering for folks that may not know your uh, organization and its interests very well, could you share a little bit about some of the roles that you played in supporting um, community power and power building? Yeah, sure. First of all, um, Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund, we are a family foundation, it stems from the Levi Strauss Company based here in San Francisco. And we've been around for nearly 70 years and we've tried a lot of different approaches to lift up um, communities and families and improve the lives of individuals. And we work hard to advance equality and justice so every person has opportunities to thrive and live life with dignity and hope. And just like the California Endowment and what Tony was talking about, we try to tackle the fundamentals. And so we focus a lot on grassroots organizing, voting, power building in immigrant communities, LGBT communities, and we have two new areas that we've been going deep on, which is kind of the structural challenges of our democracy, which I think for all of us today, I don't need to tell you how important that is. And then also we've been tackling college affordability. And um, the reason for that is too many Californians and people across the country who have the motivation and the desire to, to go to college, but if it's the money that's holding them back, something is wrong. And so we're wondering about activating that population um, to, to change the equation for affordability and success. So those are a couple of examples of work that we do. Thank you, Kathy. And as you've been um, digging into some of the lessons that have come out of uh, the work of building healthy communities and TC's engagement over the past 10 years and hearing uh, some of Tony's reflections, what are some of the lessons and um, learnings that most resonate with you and your experience uh, at Haas Jr.? Yeah, you know, I appreciate that intro because as I was listening to Tony, I realized you know, we've been really working alongside the California Endowments Building Healthy, uh, Building Healthy Communities Initiative. And we often partner because we have the same vision for the kind of world that we want for these communities that we care about. And so in a lot of ways, we've been also trying different ways to improve the lives of low-income Californians. And one of the things I wanted to share was, um, you know, we didn't come to power building 
first. It was after years of trying different things to improve um, the situation for low-income Californians. And about 10 years ago, when I used to run the immigrant rights program here at Huss Jr., a community leader said something to me that has really stayed with me all these years. She said, quote, there's no shortage of good ideas. We lack the power to get them over the finish line. Meaning, we have so many well-researched policy reforms out there, but they don't have the votes or the influence to make them real. And that's a lot like we're seeing in DC right now with the mega bills, right? No shortage of good ideas. We lack the power to get them over the finish line. So that has really stayed with me and influenced our work. And so for years, we have wanted immigrants to realize their full potential in this country and be part of the economic and social fabric of our communities. So we set off to build the strength of the California immigrant rights movement with community leaders with that phrase, you know, it's not the power, we don't have the power to get it over the finish line. In my head, we really worked in partnership with community leaders across the state. And I wanna tell you, we've always had some very strong immigrant rights nonprofits in California. So there's a great pool of partners to draw from, but there were gaps. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have much advocacy strength beyond the Bay Area and LA. Uh, groups didn't have strong strategic communications and narrative building muscles. And civic engagement and getting out the vote was new to many of the groups. And back then, California's policy context was a lot more like Arizona, trying to shut out immigrants from public benefits, creating difficult lives for undocumented immigrants and their families. And so today, we can proudly say that California is the most pro-immigrant and welcoming state in the country. And it's really been because of the strength of the immigrant rights movement here. And so we didn't ever start with that level of power or impact, right? So the origin story of the latest chapter of immigrant rights work in California is much more modest. And it says a lot about what funders can do. So first of all, at Haas Jr., um, it was a disciplined and learned behavior to not lead with our own issues and our priorities. Um, instead, we looked for organic places where communities were coming together. And this meant we had to let go a bit and see what was bubbling up. And the first thing folks wanted to work on was nothing I could have ever guessed sitting in my office. What was riling them up was DUI checkpoints. So 10 years ago, DUI checkpoints were popping up all over the state but not in downtown areas with bars at night. Instead, these checkpoints were showing up on a Sunday morning in Latino, Latina communities an hour before mass started all across the state. And it turns out these DUI checkpoints were a pretense for checking papers and immigration status. It did not have anything to do with driving with after drinking. And it was really the beginning of some very, very um, uh, difficult immigration and police collaboration that was leading to dragnets to try and um, deport more undocumented immigrants. So we began investing by working with a group of leaders to try to learn more about what was going on. And so with a group of leaders, we shaped a research piece that UC Berkeley uh, Law School actually did and brought these groups together to develop a survey and to conduct a survey to find out what was happening with these checkpoints. Then we supported strategic communications efforts and the group started thinking about shaping a narrative that personalized this issue, helped make the issue come home and also let the injustice really shine through for what it was. And so they lifted up the real story of an immigrant family coming home from the hospital with their new baby. And what should have been a joyous time ended up um, tragic. So the family got pulled over at one of these DUI checkpoints 
And the mother who had just had a C-section, the dad, their newborn, and their toddler got their car impounded and were literally thrown out of their car and stuck on the side of a road. And so the advocates did a great job working together for the first time in that coordinated statewide way to get that story blasted out all throughout the state. And it worked, it hit a chord. It hit a chord with the general public and it hit a chord with lawmakers. And so the first policy win was not earth shattering. When you get pulled over for a DUI checkpoint and your car is getting impounded, you can now call your family or friend to come and get your car. That's it, very simple. But how it was done was an incredible movement success. The win came directly up from community priorities. The diversity of immigrant communities worked together. Northern, Southern, inland, coastal in California worked together and they successfully shaped the narratives on these checkpoints. And those are movement building metrics. And you know what? After getting a taste of this first victory, the group said, okay, what's next? What are we gonna work on together next? They didn't go back to their corners and work independently. They wanted to take on the next successive challenge. And at that point, I knew we were on to something. So fast forward, that's exactly what they did. And now the California immigrant rights movement is strong, has put the concept of separating police and immigration enforcement on the national stage, has ex exported a bunch of very important policy reforms to separate public safety and police with immigration enforcement. And most importantly, the lives of immigrants in California have improved significantly. So today, over 100 pro-immigrant laws have passed in our state house since that modest DUI win. And over $500 million has been invested in immigrant communities. And more importantly, California is showing the country that embracing your immigrant communities results in a happy ending. Our kids are playing soccer together and our economy and communities are stronger. So it's important sometimes to recognize that you have to start small and build from there. And our, I think our experience illustrates one of the lessons from the BHC report beautifully, which was um, the lesson that says, look, measure the growth of power building capacity over time. And when these building block pieces were coming together, the ability to shape a narrative, voter turnout increases, partnerships across the state, folks working across race lines, the younger undocumented dreamers working with their aunties and their grandmothers, I knew we were moving towards something more ambitious and more transformational. So let me end there and turn it back to you, Anand. Thank you, Kathy. And Tony, I'd love to kind of get you uh, involved uh, in the conversation again. And there are so many parallels, which is exactly why we were so excited to have Kathy uh, join us. Parallels between the work of Haas Jr. and other uh, folks who are supporting community power and the experience of the California endowment and building healthy communities. So would love for you to kind of share um, an example of, um, you know, kind of those same types of principles of investing for the long game, starting small, listening to communities. And I know that there are numerous examples of where you all are, or partners, I should say, have been in communities asking, what does a healthy community look like? And it's kind of led to some interesting um, ideas and would just love to hear you, uh, Tony, just kind of share some of the examples and help bring that to life from the BHC experience. Yeah, and, and it was such a pleasure listening to Kathy and, and A was bringing back the memories of being engaged in some of that work. And, you know, what she's describing is, is essentially increasing a sense of agency, you know, power and control uh, in a population that has essentially been marginalized. And, and, and we believe that that sense of agency is critical to health. So what Kathy's describing is really a health initiative. Um, my favorite story, and, and, and there are so many from Building Healthy Communities, there are over 1,700 policy wins, systems changes, tangible benefits that we chronicled over the 10 years. 
um, comes out of the Central Valley, which is really kind of our most conservative region um, in the state, and and the city of Fresno and 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 Fresno County and and a group of of community residents in Fresno who basically polled uh, their community at the beginning of building healthy communities to try to understand what it was that people really saw, envisioned, um, you know, as a, a healthy community. And one of the things that came up in a big way was parks and parkland, uh, places, safe places for young people to, to play, you know, during the summers and schools, places that were maintained and, and had facilities and opportunities for kids to develop their talents and their skills and their leadership and, and the like. And so the community set about working with the city to try to um, assess ways of growing park space in, in the southern part of Fresno. And one of the first things that they discovered when looking at the general plan in Fresno was that the parks master plan hadn't been uh, updated for something like 20 years. And when they looked at the actual mapping of park space in Fresno, that there was five times as much park per capita in the northern part of the city where it's wealthier and whiter than in the southern part. And the quality of the parks in the southern part were was very poor. They were poorly maintained. The bathrooms were just boarded up. Um, the fields, the grasses were run raw. And so they started documenting this and they created a campaign um, which was called Parks for All. And one of the most incredible things that they did was that they took the actual metrics, the data from the general plan, this five times uh, per capita park space in the north, and they made a bus banner of it. And um, they went to the, uh, the Fresno Bus Company and said, we'd like to put this up on the buses. Well, the city said, no, we don't want any political uh, messaging on our buses. And the community said, political? I mean, we literally took data from your own parks master plan. And so it became a big fight. It got national press attention. Um, and it ended up uh, generating the kind of uh, attention that they, they hadn't even anticipated, much more than they would have got from people just seeing it on the side of buses. And as a consequence, they recognized that they were onto something. They managed to get the city to commit to um, you know, uh, prioritizing South Fresno for some parks bond money. Uh, they went further. They gathered signatures for a political campaign, an initiative called uh, Measure P. Um, and they won 51% of Fresno voters voted for Measure P, which would provide for uh, some 20 years resources for parks and um, arts uh, in Fresno. The city challenged it, said that they needed a two-thirds majority. So the, the Fresno Building Healthy Communities folks sued the city and won uh, in the Supreme Court. So now they're looking at two billion plus over the pendency of, of, of Measure P uh, for parks uh, throughout Fresno uh, with an emphasis on South Fresno now that the master plan has been updated. So this was, you know, this came from a group of largely undocumented uh, people or disproportionately undocumented Fresno residents who'd been excluded from decision making forever in Fresno. And they organized through building healthy communities and created the political muscle to be able to challenge not only the city, the mayor, the police chief, the fire chief, the chamber of commerce, uh, but to win in the Supreme Court these resources, uh, which will have profound health improvement impacts on young people in South Fresno for generations to come. And they're not done yet. Uh, you know, the city now consults with this group when making decisions about pursuing bonds and various other political decisions that the city is considering. So that, that to me is just such a heartening story coming out of one of the most conservative parts of California um, as a result of the same fundamental strategy of recognizing that that health is political, and you know, building the political muscle of communities to hold systems accountable for equity is a health improvement strategy. Thank you, Tony. And I want to give each of you, uh, Kathy and Tony, a chance to share um, kind of reflections on the role of philanthropy in supporting this work and um, what different roles that. Uh, foundations can play, and then any closing thoughts that, that you want to offer. Uh, but before I do that, I just hope folks can understand if you came here because you thought it was interesting conversation on health equity, 
Uh, they're certainly focused on that. If you came here because you were interested in democratic inclusion, civic participation, hopefully you got a taste of that, but also saw why we brought together these topics uh, under this conversation of a new uh, health equity narrative that maybe on the face of it don't seem like they're connected, but I really appreciate um, Tony and Kathy making those connections about why um, participation in our civic processes in elections and being active uh, in a nonpartisan sense is really, really important for a community and health well-being. And it, it's why I think there were so many connections between the experience of Haas Jr. and the experience of the California Endowment over the past 10 years and in, in the Building Healthy Communities Initiative. So before we close out, um, I'd love to have you, Kathy, first just share kind of reflections on what's the role? How can foundations uh, best support and share power with, with communities? Uh, and then any other kind of closing uh, thoughts you want to offer before we end today? Yeah, thank you, Anand. I would love to um, just challenge and suggest that funders learn and look for places where there's organic energy, where folks are already coming together, where folks are already interested and build on that. And I have a phrase that I sometimes say internally, which is you can't bring the community folks in, your partners in too early. There's just no such thing. And so we call it co-design at Haas Jr. We often start with folks when something is just a nub of an idea and we're brainstorming, we bring community leaders and partners in. And I'll just end with a brief thought about um, an example of that. I think after these very difficult years where we've had the health pandemic and the racism pandemic and all the isolation that we've all experienced, one out of all of this disruption, I think one hopeful thing for me is how at the beginning, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, we would look at low wage workers who are ignored, neglected, unappreciated, and we've seen exploited. And we've seen the importance of low wage workers in our day to day lives in an incredibly profound way. And now they are being called essential workers. So to go from exploited, ignored, invisible to essential. And wait till Christmas happens, folks, when all those shipyards are full of pallets of toys that have not been emptied. We have the incredible opportunity to build on something organic that is happening in our society right now. And that profound shift in this moment of hardship, disruption, and challenge, to me, really shows if you can go from low wage worker to essential worker, we don't want to just go back to where we were two years ago. We can go to a new place that is way more bold, way more promising, and way better for everybody in our society. So I would just leave you with that. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Kathy. And Tony would love to give you the same opportunity to share some closing thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Anand. Um, you know, we spent a a billion eight dollars over uh, the 10 years of building healthy communities, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's really a drop in the bucket compared to what government spends every day, um, allegedly trying to improve health and um, opportunity for all. So what did we learn for that money? Well, I like to boil it down. I'm a pretty simple-minded person. And I say that the key ingredients were A, B, C. And A stands for agency, which is really a sense of control uh, and power at the individual, at the family, and at the community level, particularly at the community level. B stands for belonging, which I like to think of in some ways as the opposite of racism. It's a sense of being seen, being heard, having your story known in your community and being valued. And part of doing the work of creating belonging is addressing the historical narrative in this country, which is a narrative of exclusion, and it's a narrative of racialized apartheid. And we learned a very, very hard lesson in this work, and that is that you have to create the time and the space for people to be able to heal uh, from the trauma and the injury of racism in order to move forward. And then the C of ABC is really about conditions, fundamental conditions of opportunity. 
And too much of the work that we see, particularly in the health space, is really about services, which are remedial and largely transactional. And what we've recognized is if you don't focus on those core conditions, uh, and that's what Kathy was talking about with the immigrant rights uh, issue, the conditions that people face when they interact with these critical systems, the criminal justice system, the health system, the land use system, the education system, if those systems are essentially traps that drive people off of high trajectories and, and trap them uh, into these these systems that kind of don't let go of them, um, then we have a real problem with health and equity. If those systems are instead springboards to opportunity, um, then we have an opportunity to facilitate people being able to participate in the 21st century economy. So we learned ABC will continue over the next 10 years to invest in those core ingredients of equity. And we recognize that uh, we still have a lot of learning to do but California is really America's future. And we look forward to helping to build that future with Kathy and with other partners uh, for the next decade and beyond. Thank you so much, Tony. And if those of you who are tuned in want to keep learning, we have barely scratched the surface. There are so many reports and resources um, pulling lessons learned and showing the uh, not always straight path uh, that comes out so neatly in these types of conversations. Uh, to where the California endowment and the work of building healthy communities has, has ended up. So if you're interested in learning more about community power and what investments, what does that actually look like? How do foundations need to reorient themselves? What are some of the different roles foundations can play in partnering authentically with communities, helping to change narratives and realizing that they are but one of many, many different actors and players in an ecosystem. There are so many resources to check out. We encourage you and hope we've piqued your interest. Uh, if you like today's conversation, two weeks from today, November 4th, same time, same channel, we have another leap pad with Dr. Robert Ross, the president of the California Endowment, in conversation with uh, Carla Ortiz and Christopher Covington, two, uh, a past and a current member of the President's Youth Council, talking about some of the work that TC has done to share uh, and embrace youth power. So we hope you'll you'll tune in for that. Uh, but really just want to thank uh, Kathy for sharing uh, her experience and the work of Haas Jr. I want to thank uh, Tony for sharing some of the, his reflections from the work of the California Endowment. Would be remiss not to mention that we're talking about the roles of the foundations, but the, this is the work of literally thousands of people across California in communities who have been advocating, organizing, sharing their stories, um, and certainly don't want that to be uh, lost. None of this would be possible without that. And last of all, I want to thank all of you for, for tuning in and your interest in thinking about um, learning, equity, and power. And with that, uh, thanks again for uh, your time. Thanks to our guests and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. <music>